this is a joint effort uh, between uh, the urology departments in San Rafael and Santa Rosa, and then also our radiation oncology facility in Rohnert Park. Uh, the other doctors here today, so Dr. Michael Shulman's in the back. He's a urologist from uh, Santa Rosa. And then I have Dr. Uh, Jay Bellani here. He's a urologist from Kaiser San Rafael. I'll just ask you for one thing today. We'll be, uh, since we're videotaping this, uh, rather than taking questions as we go along, I'll just ask that you hold your questions and at the end of uh, each section, we'll stop, we'll be trading the microphone anyway, and then we'll be able to answer questions. And then we'll also be here after the class to answer questions as well. So if you have a question on a particular slide, uh, just hang on for a moment and we'll make sure to answer those questions kind of at, at set points today. Uh, the goals for the class today are, are twofold. The main one is helping you learn about prostate cancer. We want to help you learn how to read your pathology report. You should have some of that information uh, from registering upstairs. The, the urologist who's sending you here will have copied some of that information into that sheet. And it will give you an idea about how aggressive or how risky your prostate cancer is, which will have some implications about treatment options. And that's the second part of our talk today. We'll help you learn about different prostate cancer treatments, what the benefits are and specifics are of each type of treatment, and then we'll also go over side effects of each treatment as well. Uh, a couple things that we mentioned is we're just really here to try to help educate you today. Uh, if you don't feel like you know exactly what you need to do or you know what kind of treatment, if any, you're going to choose, that's okay. We're really just trying to get the ball started uh, in terms of figuring out who you need to talk to next. And then one thing is that feel free to ask questions. Again, I mentioned saving them for the end of sections when we uh, start taking questions. Uh, but we ask that you don't disclose any of your personal medical information about other medical conditions or anything specific to your prostate cancer. Uh, in this forum, we just don't want you to feel like you have to divulge that in front of other people. If you think there's, there's something specific about your case that has some implication in terms of what type of treatment you should choose, uh, that's best to be asked after the class in a one-on-one -on -one setting with one of the doctors here. Some basics about prostate cancer, very common disease. It's the second most common cancer in men behind skin cancers. Over 200,000 cases of prostate cancer will be diagnosed this year. Another way of saying that is every five years, more than a million men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And in each individual year, you know, again, I said about 200,000 plus people are diagnosed. Eventually, 30,000 of that 200,000 plus men will die of prostate cancer. Another way of saying that, another statistical way of saying that is that, you know, for men that live to an older age, about one in five men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer but only about one of those, of that one in five, one in seven will die of prostate cancer. So most people die with prostate cancer or with a history of prostate cancer, but they don't die of prostate cancer. The American Cancer Society came out with a couple mission statements uh, last year or the year before, one of which was for men with cancer that has not spread beyond the prostate, the five-year survival rate is 100%, whether or not they are treated. Furthermore, 10-year survival is nearly the same as in men without prostate cancer. Early diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer will help some men to live longer. So for the majority of men, prostate cancer is a slow-growing process, but there are things that can uh, indicate to us that a cancer is more aggressive. We'll go over those today. Anatomically, what is the prostate? So it's a gland. It sits in between the rectum and the bladder, uh, produces the majority of the seminal fluid. And it uses testosterone, uh, or sh I should say testosterone kind of activates and uh, makes the prostate grow. In regards to prostate cancer, how do we evaluate prostate cancer? How do we say how risky prostate cancer is? There's several things. There's the cancer stage or the exam with the finger. There's the blood test or the PSA. There's the biopsy results or the Gleason score. And sometimes we use imaging. We'll talk about when we get imaging tests on patients. In regards to staging, staging, this is a pictorial of a doctor doing a digital rectal exam, so fingers in the rectum. And you can see the doctor is feeling the back of the prostate. So here's the rectum, finger in the rectum. Here's the bladder. And the urethra goes through the prostate. So the doctor is able to feel the back of the prostate. So it's not the most sensitive exam. You're only able to feel the back of the prostate. When we talk about prostate cancer staging, meaning what you can feel on the finger, the most common stage is what we call a T1C. That basically means that on a digital rectal exam, on a finger exam, you can't feel anything on the prostate. The only reason that you did a biopsy was because the PSA was elevated. 
and the biopsy showed cancer. So this diagram is just trying to show a cancer in the middle of the prostate that can't be felt with the finger. Again, the most common stage. A T2 cancer is a cancer that can be felt with the finger. So this is approaching the edge of the prostate, something that could be felt. There's different subgroups of T2 cancers, whether they're small or large, whether they're on one side or both sides of the prostate. But the take home message is that a T2 tumor you can feel with the finger and it's just on the prostate. A T3 tumor is a tumor that you can feel, but it feels like it's gone a little bit beyond the prostate, either past the shell or lining of the prostate or into a gland called the seminal vesicle which sits above and behind the prostate that stores uh, prostatic fluid. So T3 is a tumor that you can feel. This is pretty unusual for us to feel a tumor this advanced. Even more unusual and rare would be a T4 tu tumor. In this diagram, this is just trying to show a tumor that's spread into the bladder, which sits above the prostate. PSA, or the blood test. Prostate-specific antigen, a, pr a protein only made by the prostate, so only found in men. Uh, as as you, people get older, the PSA generally goes up just based on size of the prostate. But PSA can also go up if people have prostate cancer. There's a lot of debate and controversy about PSA as a screening test. However, when we know that someone has prostate cancer, which we know in you know, patients coming to this class because of their biopsy, we generally say that PSAs of less than 10 are low risk or less aggressive. PSAs between 10 and 20 are intermediate or middle risk, and 20 and above are high risk. And PSAs before any type of treatment are very useful to us because if they're high, if they're over 20, it tells us that there's more of a chance that the prostate cancer may have spread and we may order tests like bone scans or CAT scans, basically imaging tests, just to make sure there's not any spread of the cancer. As much as controversy as there is about PSA as a screening test, it's an excellent test after treatment, so after surgery, after radiation, to see if the prostate cancer is under control. We also look at the, what the cancer looks like under the microscope, the biopsy results. And uh, Gleason was a pathologist who looked at prostate tissue under the microscope and tried to give an idea about how aggressive the cancer was. The scoring system that he came up with was a scoring system from one to five, where one was the least aggressive and five was the most aggressive. In, in kind of practical use nowadays, no one, no pathologist scores a cancer less than a three. So although the scoring system is from one to five, it's essentially from three to five. The way that he would do this is he would look under the microscope and he'd find the largest area of cancer and give that a score of one to five. Then he would find the next largest area of cancer and give that a score of one to five and he would combine those numbers together. So in his system, it was a, basically a score of two to 10. But in our you know, kind of modern day uh, pathology, the lowest score is a three plus three. And we consider that low in terms of aggressiveness. When the numbers are added together, if you get an 8 through 10, we consider that high. And if when you add those numbers together, you get 7, we consider that kind of intermediate risk. One thing we differentiate is a 3 plus 4 and a 4 plus 3, while they both add to 7. A 3 plus 4 is less aggressive because the first number is the dominant or larger area, and the second number is the, most common, the next most common area. So a 3 plus 4 is less aggressive than a 4 plus 3. We wrote down there at the bottom that sometimes it's important that even if the first two numbers are three or four, so three plus three or four plus four, if the third most common area is a five, meaning the most aggressive cancer, we ask the pathologist to note that on the pathology report. When the urologists were filling out your forms today, there's a question there that says, is there tertiary five? That basically means is the third most common area five. For the majority of people in the room, the answer will be no. Beyond just the Gleason score, uh, there's one kind of other big thing that's important to us is finding out how positive the biopsy was. So this is a diagram showing you a typical biopsy. Now the prostate is like a pyramid pointing down. The base is at the top and the apex is at the bottom. Typically the urologist will take a couple samples from the left and the right from the top, middle, and bottom, the base, middle, and apex. So usually people will have 12 biopsies done. Sometimes a couple more biopsies from the middle of the prostate will be done as well. This diagram is showing you that in this particular person or patient, 12 biopsies were done and two were positive. So you can imagine that two people could have the same Gleason score of three plus three, but it would be important to know if one person had one biopsy positive and the other person had 
all 12 of their biopsies positive. The second person has a more aggressive cancer. It's in more parts of the prostate. In addition, we asked the pathologist to tell us of the biopsy, which is a little tiny string of tissue, we asked them to measure the length of the biopsy, and then we also asked them to tell us how much cancer there is in each biopsy specimen. So again, as I was saying a second ago, two people having the same PSA and Gleason could be very different. One person could have one millimeter of cancer in one core. One person could have the same Gleason and PSA, but their whole prostate, all the samples could be positive, and each one of those cores could be filled with cancer. Those are two very different patients. I mentioned a few slides ago about using imaging. So the two most common imaging, imaging tests that we use are bone scans and CAT scans. Bone scans are used to look at uh, for any possible spread to the bones. CAT scans are used to look for any spread of the cancer to lymph nodes. We commonly get these tests when the cancer looks aggressive. If the Gleason score is high, 8 through 10, or the PSA is greater than 20. Some people will ask, why not get that for everyone, even if the cancer looks less aggressive? The main reason is if the cancer isn't aggressive by PSA or Gleason, the chance of those tests being positive is extremely low, and there's much more harm in terms of the contrast for the, the, the scans and the radiation from the scans than the chance of finding something. But again, when the cancer looks aggressive, we routinely get these tests. As you research prostate cancer and maybe using the internet or talking to friends, you'll hear about some investigational imaging, imaging that's kind of being uh, researched right now including PET scans and MRIs. What I would tell you is that, you know, not too many years ago, even CAT scans and, and bone scans were somewhat experimental, and now they're very much standard of care. So with further research, some of these tests that we have listed here may become standard of care in the future. Right now, they're being investigated at research universities for the most part. Kind of tying all this information together, the digital rectal exam, the blood test, the, the PSA, and the biopsy results, the Gleason score, we try to put people into different risk groups to figure out how aggressive the cancer is and what kind of treatments are uh, appropriate. When we talk about risk, we're talking about what's the chance of the cancer already having spread, what's the chance of the cancer coming back despite treatment, and what's the chance of someone dying eventually from prostate cancer. Low risk prostate cancer. It's important that you note that the words and are in bold. All three criteria need to be fulfilled for a patient to be considered low risk. The PSA needs to be less than 10. The Gleason score has to be six or less. And six, again, is essentially the lowest number. And the disease has to be stage T2A or less. So that basically means a small bump on one side of the prostate, or you're not able to feel anything on the digital exam. Intermediate risk prostate cancer the words or are in bold. So any one of these three things will make you intermediate risk. If your PSA is between 10 and 20, if your Gleason score is 7, or if you have stage T2B disease. Again, that's something that you can feel with the finger also on one half of the prostate, but kind of a little bit bigger, taking up more than one half of one side of the prostate. And finally, high risk prostate cancer. Again, the words or are bolded. Any one of these three things would make you high risk. If the PSA is over 20, if your Gleason score is 8 through 10, or if your stage T2C or higher. That basically means that you can feel something on digital rectal exam on both sides of the prostate. When we talk about treatment options by risk group, you'll notice that when we move from low risk to intermediate risk and intermediate risk to high risk, treatment options drop off the table. The lower the risk, the more options there are. For low risk disease, there's many options. There's surgery, which Dr. Balani will talk about radical prostatectomy. There's putting radioactive seeds in the prostate or brachytherapy. There's external radiation. There's active surveillance, which Dr. Shulman will talk to you about, basically watching the cancer until it shows signs of becoming more aggressive. That's only applicable, applicable for people with low-risk disease. There's something called watchful waiting, which we'll talk about at the end of the class. And we'll also talk about some uh, newer and more excuse me, excuse me, experimental options, uh, like ultrasound treatment and freezing the prostate, cryotherapy. When you move, we move to intermediate risk disease, you'll notice that active surveillance dropped off the list. Otherwise, there's really uh, not much change. The same treatment options are there. With external radiation, we sometimes add anti-hormonal therapy. I'll talk about that. When we move to high risk disease, you'll notice that brachytherapy or putting seeds in the prostate has dropped out. Uh, and at the bottom, we have a term called multimodal therapy. That just means sometimes we combine treatments like surgery and radiation. 
uh, for high-risk disease. My name is Jay Balani. I'm one of the urology physicians in San Rafael. I'm going to be talking about the radical prostatectomy or the surgery to remove the prostate gland. So what we're going to talk about when we talk about radical prostatectomy is what do we do? What are the different methods to take out the prostate gland? What to expect after surgery? And what are our outcomes in regards to what happens with the surgery? When we talk about radical prostatectomy, the first thing we want to focus on is what's the technique. That way everyone has an idea of what we're doing during the surgery. The first thing is we're trying to remove the entire prostate gland and the seminal vesicles. I'll show you a picture in just a second. This is different than surgery that's done for an enlarged prostate. Someone can have a prostatectomy if they're having trouble urinating, and that can be done for an enlarged prostate. Another way to think about it, it's kind of like a rotor rooter of the prostate, or another abbreviation for that is a TURP. With that surgery, what the urologist is doing for the most common type of procedures is they're putting a scope in through the urethra and cleaning out the inside of the prostate gland. They're not removing the entire prostate gland. A radical prostatectomy is different. We're talking about removing the entire prostate gland and the seminal vesicles which sit behind the prostate gland. So the way we do this surgery is we separate the prostate from the bladder, rectum, and the urethra. We then remove the prostate out and we sew the bladder to the urethra and we put in a catheter. That's a plastic tube that drains the urine from the bladder to let that area where we sewed things to heal. Our goal is to attempt to spare the nerves going to the penis and cure the cancer. We may also remove pelvic lymph nodes. Those are nodes that are in the pelvis of the body where prostate cancer may spread to. Whether or not we remove the pelvic lymph nodes is dependent on the stage of the prostate cancer, your Gleason score, and your PSA. So here's a picture of what's going on down there. You have the bladder sitting up here. The seminal vesicles are these purple things sitting behind the prostate gland. You then have the urethra with the sphincter here and your nerves here. The sphincter is what helps you control the urination so you're not leaking urine. The nerves here are what go to the penis to help for your erections. The lymph nodes are separate from the prostate and the bladder and in your pelvis. So when we do the surgery, what we do is we remove the prostate gland with the seminal vesicles. We separate it off the bladder, we try to peel these nerves off the prostate gland, and we do our best to spare your sphincter so we don't get into it when we come around this way. After we've removed the entire prostate gland and the seminal vesicles, you're then left with the bladder sewn to the urethra so that you have the urethra here, stitches holding the two things together, your sphincter here, and your nerves here going to your penis. So there are different ways of accomplishing this goal. One is an open radical prostatectomy. And this is where we can either do it through what's called a radical retropubic prostatectomy. That means we're removing the entire prostate gland through an incision that goes behind the pubic bone. Okay? The second is called a radical perineal prostatectomy. And that's where we remove the entire prostate gland through an incision in your perineum, which is the area between your testicles and your anus. So we make an incision down there. And the final way of taking out the prostate gland is a robotic assisted or laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. And that's where you make small incisions in the belly to go in and remove the prostate gland. I'll show you pictures or diagrams of each. So we're first talking, I'm going to talk about the radical retropubic prostatectomy. And the way we do this surgery is we make an incision in the lower part of the belly. You make an incision here, you get in behind the pubic bone and remove the prostate gland like we talked about. This is the standard of care. It's the way we've been doing the surgery for many, many years. The advantage of this approach is that the surgeon can feel the prostate gland. 
their hand is in there, they can feel what's going on in and around the prostate gland. The second thing is that you're outside of the abdominal cavity. There is an area outside of your bowel structure where you can get into, go in and remove the prostate gland so you don't enter any of the area where your bowels are sitting, even though you're making an incision in the belly. The second thing within our Kaiser system is that the operation can be done close to home, which means you can either have it done in Santa Rosa, if you're closer there, or San Rafael, depending on what's easier for you. The next approach is called a radical perineal prostatectomy. Here the incision is made below the testicles, in the perineum. You can see the incision is down here. The advantage of this approach is that the blood loss is less because of the technique involved, and it's a slightly quicker recovery. We consider doing this for obese men because if you have a lot more, um, if you have a more obesity in the abdominal structure, it's harder to get to the prostate gland. And sometimes it's easier to get it from this angle here. The next approach is called the robotic assisted or laparoscopic prostatectomy. Here we use small keyhole size incisions, small little incisions. We use a robot to help come onto the port and help control the instruments. The surgeon in the robotic approach sits separate from the patient and they're controlling the robotic arms while the robot inside the belly mimics what the surgeon is doing to remove the prostate gland. The advantage of this approach is that you can see things magnified. So everything is a little bit clearer to see. There's less blood loss because of the nature of how you're doing the procedure and you have the wrist movements of the instrument in the way the robot can move. So it helps with some of the dexterity involved with the operation. So which approach is best for you? Well, that depends on who you are. It depends on your stage of your prostate cancer. It depends on what other medical problems you have. It depends on your weight. All these play a factor. The other thing is it's dependent on the surgeon. Each surgeon is experienced with different techniques. So it's important to talk to the urologist that sent you in to see what their feeling is about the different techniques. And it also is dependent on your accessibility. Within our system, the robotic approach is done in Walnut Creek. And that's where it is. Another center that does it is in Santa Clara. So there is some issues with logistics behind that as well. Which technique is best? Overall, the outcomes are about the same. The cancer control outcomes are similar, the continence rates are similar, and the chance of a functional erection is similar with either approach. What do you expect? Let's say you had the surgery. Well, you're going to be sore, all right? We ask you not, not to lift anything heavy for about a month, no matter which approach you take. You'll have a catheter, which is a plastic, little plastic tube in your bladder for about one to two weeks. You cannot drive for about two weeks, and most people are able to return to work or normal activity in about a month. What are the risks of surgery? Well, there's a small chance of a blood transfusion. It's about 1% because of bleeding from the operation. There's a small risk of an infection. We minimize that risk by giving you antibiotics into your veins prior to the surgery. In addition, there's a risk of injury to nearby organs, like the rectum. You had your biopsy done through the rectum. Well, when we do the surgery, we have to peel the prostate off the rectum. Sometimes we make a hole in the rectum, and that can create a problem. There's a risk of a hernia. The hernia can develop either at the incision or in your groin. Sometimes from the, removing the prostate gland that weakens the muscles in your groin and you are at risk for developing a hernia. There's a risk of a urine leak. When we sew the bladder to the urethra, during the time of surgery, we test things out to make sure urine won't leak from that area where we've sewn things together. But after surgery, something can happen with those stitches and urine can leak out and you might need that taken care of. Then there's an issue with scar tissue. So where we sew the bladder to the urethra, normally that heals up perfectly fine. But for some people, it can scar down to a pinpoint opening and make it hard for you to empty your bladder. If you get scar tissue there, you're going to need another procedure or something done 
to help open that area up. All right? And then there's always a risk of some medical complication from the anesthetic itself, like a heart attack, a stroke, a blood clot, etc. The goal with surgery is attain the trifecta. Cure your cancer, minimize your incontinence, minimize the erectile dysfunction. So we're going to talk about those three things in some detail now. Cancer cure. The chance that you get cured with the surgery depends on your PSA, the final stage of what we find out, your final Gleason score, and what's the margin status. When we took out the prostate gland, was there cancer at the edge? That's key, and that's important in telling you whether you have a chance of being cured with the surgery. So the next issue everyone worries about, understandably, is the issue of incontinence or leaking urine. When we do the surgery, you're at risk for what's called stress incontinence, which means that you will leak when you cough, strain, go from a sitting to a standing position, or put any stress on your bladder in some way. It is frustrating, and it can take time to recover. You're going to use pads or diapers to catch the leakage, all right? Now, there are ways to minimize that leakage. The most important way to minimize that leakage is to do your Kegel exercises. Basically, we ask that you strengthen the muscles in and around the pelvic floor, in and around the urethra, to get you to control the urination and control the leakage. This helps you return your continence, and it can help you get through this whole frustrating ordeal quicker. What are our outcomes? Basically, about 10% of men are still leaking urine at one to two years, of sur years after surgery. That could be a little bit or a lot, all right? So 90% of men, so the vast majority of men, are doing well and will have returned to their continence within a year after the surgery, all right? Who's at risk? Well. If you're older, and what's older, I'm not going to tell you. There's no set cutoff. It all depends on your other medical problems. If you're obese, if you're diabetic, if you smoke, or if you have poor control before surgery, all these things put together can make it riskier for you to have significant incontinence after the surgery. Now let's talk about erectile function. When we do the surgery, we try to do what's called a nerve-sparing radical prostatectomy, which means that every attempt is made to spare the nerves surrounding the prostate that go to the penis. The factors that can affect recovery are your age, how well things work before surgery. If things don't work well before surgery, I guarantee you they're not going to work well after surgery. The number of nerves spared. Did we spare both of them on both sides of the prostate gland? Did we spare just one? or none of them at all. And then, how extensive is your prostate cancer? That can greatly influence our ability to spare your nerves. So, initially, erectile function is non-existent after the surgery. It doesn't work. It takes a few months to two years for gradual improvement. There are medications and devices that can recover, assist with your recovery. There are medications you can take by mouth that we have people try that can help. There's a vacuum device or a pump that can help pull blood into the penis to help for an erection. And then there are injections that you can inject yourself. You inject into the penis to help get an erection. All right. Here's the thing. If you have normal erections and both nerves are spared, you have the best possible chance of regaining your erections. The chances decrease significantly if only one nerve is spared. Makes sense. I'm going to go over a couple types of radiation. Uh, I'll start with internal radiation or brachytherapy, that's the radioactive seeds. And then after that I'll talk about external radiation. Uh, brachytherapy, so the, the term brachy, either in Latin or Greek, means close. So it means putting radiation sources into or close to what you're trying to, to treat. In this country, the vast majority of brachytherapy is done with radioactive iodine. That's iodine-125. It's a compound that has a half-life of 60 days. Every 60 days, it gives off half of its radiation. 
this is a picture showing you radiation seeds in relation to a dime. So it shows you that they're very small. Uh, those seeds are granules there. That whole thing isn't radioactive. It's usually a titanium capsule filled with a couple spheres or, or blocks of radioactive iodine-125. The way that a seed implant is done, so uh, looking at these two pictures, the left is a diagram, the right is an actual picture. So the brachytherapy for prostate cancer is a one-time procedure done in the operating room. Patients in the lithotomy position, like the childbirth position, and there's a rectum that's placed in the, excuse me, there's an ultrasound that's placed in the rectum looking at the prostate. And the doctor who's doing the, the seed implant, the brachytherapy procedure, can see the prostate up on a monitor. And on that monitor is an overlay. And on the overlay is, is a grid with letters and numbers. And if you look at the picture on the right, this is a picture of a patient having a prostate seed implant done. There's an ultrasound in the rectum. Here's the scrotal area, so the scrotum has been lifted. So this is the area of skin between the back of the scrotum and the anus. When Dr. Balani was talking about the perineal prostatectomy, this is the perineum. So there's a, 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 a template, a kind of a piece of material, and for those that can see it, there's letters and numbers on it. It's kind of like the kids game battleship. There's coordinates with holes, and what the radiation oncologist who does a seed implant is doing is, they're feeding needles through the holes in that template and depositing seeds into the prostate under ultrasound guidance. And so they, each needle holds about three to five seeds. Typically an implant's about 100 to 120 seeds, so there's usually about 25, 30 needles that are going through this area. It's a procedure that takes about an hour to an hour and a half on average, sometimes a little bit quicker. Again, I mentioned it's a one-time procedure done in the operating room usually under general anesthesia, sometimes it can be done with local anesthesia. So as I mentioned, typically about 100 to 120 seeds. So each individual seed is doing very little. It's depending on all the other seeds to get a nice homogeneous or even dose throughout the prostate. We mentioned that every once in a while one seed might uh, escape outside of the prostate and get into the, the bloodstream through the venous circulation. It's important to realize that each individual seed does very little. So if it migrates somewhere else in the pelvis or even distantly in the body, it's not going to cause any harm. And it doesn't lower the effectiveness of the implant. People ask, who are good candidates for brachytherapy? We're mainly looking at men with low to low intermediate risk disease. So again, the lower the risk of the disease, the less likely the cancer is at the edge of the prostate. As I told you, the seeds don't kind of work very far. They're very... Uh, kind of finite in their distance of radiation. So if the cancer is localized, we believe it's localized based on it being low risk, then a person would be a good candidate for the brachytherapy. However, if you've got a high PSA or high Gleason and we think there's more chance that the cancer is at the edge or outside the edge of the prostate, then brachytherapy is not a good option. So we generally say that if your PSA is less than 10 and you have a low Gleason score, like a three plus three or a three plus four, you're a good candidate. Beyond just the specifics of the cancer, there's some other things that we look for. Uh, people that have good urinary function are generally those that tolerate the seed implant better. So if you have a lot of urgency and frequency and problems like that, even before any treatment, you're going to be one of those people who's at higher risk to develop complications after a brachytherapy implant. So we generally steer those patients away from seed implant. If you've got a really large prostate, and your uro urologist could tell you if, if you do, uh, based on the ultrasound that you've already had for your biopsy. It can make the seed implant difficult either because it would take too many seeds or the prostate might be blocked in some way by some of the bones in the pelvis. And finally, if you've had any prostate operations in the past, especially the TERP or Rotorooter, we don't think you're a good candidate for brachytherapy. Uh, it, it's basically like imp trying to implant a donut where the donut is almost entirely made of the hole. So, uh, again, anyone who's had any prior prostate operations, especially the TERP, is not a good candidate for brachytherapy. What are some advantages of brachytherapy? I'll talk about external radiation a little bit later, later but it, it kind of combines some of the advantages of surgery and external radiation in that it's a one-time procedure, but because the radiation is working from the inside out rather than the outside in of external radiation, there tends to be less damage to surrounding tissues, like the bladder and the rectum. And then one kind of puzzling thing for us is we we've anecdotally have seen that erectile dysfunction may be a little bit better with the brachytherapy, 
but it's very important for me to let you guys know that there's no randomized trials or studies comparing surgery, external radiation, and, and the seed implants in terms of outcomes including um, uh, erectile dysfunction. So I often tell people this might be a self-fulfilling prophecy where people hear this and if you have good erectile function you gravitate towards this procedure. And again, the better the patients are going into a certain treatment, the better they're going to be compared to others on the opposite side. For example, with external radiation, we tend to get uh, much older men who already have poor erectile dysfunction. But we mention this because some investigators have seen that erectile function may be a little bit better with the seed implant compared to the other options. What are side effects of uh, brachytherapy or the seed implant? The main ones are urinary, such as frequency and urgency and maybe some pain with urination. The majority of people, about 85% of people, go home that same day uh, from the seed implant without a catheter. But about 15% of people, because of swelling of the prostate or blood clots, may need to go home with a catheter for a few days. Some men may need urinary medicines to help with symptoms such as frequency and burning. A little less common, but some people can have trouble with their bowels. Whether it's from the anesthesia or just the, the implant itself, you could be tired. I think one of the biggest questions people has, have are, are you going to be safe around other people carrying radioactive uh, material in your body? So important to remember that the bones of the pelvis tend to block up most of the radiation dose from the sides and the back. It's really only from the front that there's any appreciable radiation. And as I told you, the, the seeds are degrading very quickly. Half of the energy is gone every two months. So we just ask that you don't have pregnant uh, women or children on your lap or directly in front of you for extended periods of time in the first uh, couple months. But sitting next to your spouse or partner or, or lying in bed next to your spouse or partner, even immediately after the implant, there's really no danger from the radiation that you're carrying. Going to the airport, tens of thousands of men have had this procedure, so airport uh, security uh, is very adept at figuring out people that uh, either because of the metal or because of the radiation are tripping the detectors. Long-term side effects from brachytherapy. So some men, even months or years after the treatment, may have trouble with their stream, urinary stream being weaker. They may always notice some stinging with urination. They may need to stay on urinary medicines long term. Some people can get scar tissue in the urethra, sometimes even requiring a procedure to uh, clear some of that. As I mentioned, there is erectile dysfunction from brachytherapy. Rectal injuries are rare with brachytherapy, but they can happen. And we know with any type of radiation, uh, even a tr therapeutic or treatment type of radiation, it can cause a cancer. The chance of a, a radiation caused by brachytherapy is about one in 1,000, and on average it takes 10 to 20 years to happen. If you decide you'd like to pursue brachytherapy, we do all of our uh, procedures in Roseville near Sacramento. The reason we do that is so that the doctors who do it can stay very active and keep their proficiency up. It's one of the busiest centers in the country, doing several hundred cases a year. If you wanted to go through the process of doing the seed implant, you'd attend a class like this in Sacramento, in Lincoln actually, first, just to learn a little bit more about the procedure. It's much more focused on brachytherapy than this class. And then you'd need to go back to Sacramento, that area, to plan the implant and actually have the implant done. But then all of your follow-up would be done uh, back here by your local urologist. So once the implant is done, there's no need to return to the Sacramento area. And again, I mentioned it's an outpatient procedure, usually done in the morning or early afternoon and home the same day. I'm going to go ahead and talk about external radiation, but as I said earlier, I'll, I will take questions about everything uh, when we switch over, when I switch over to Dr. Shulman. This is just a picture of our center in Rohnert Park uh, where we do external radiation treatment. Uh, we take care of patients from both Kaiser Santa Rosa and Kaiser San Rafael. It's a picture of a linear accelerator, a machine that makes radiation. Uh, basically, it accelerates electrons to the speed of light and bombards it against metal, creating a, a particle called a photon, P-H-O-T-O-N, and that's aimed at the patient. So it's hard to see here, but there's a table that a patient would lie down, lie down on, and the radiation would come from the head of the machine down at the prostate. The machine can also rotate 360 degrees and aim from different directions. I'm going to come back to this picture in a second. This picture is a picture of a CAT scan of a patient. Not so important that you understand what's going on here. The main uh, uh, reason for showing you this slide is to show you that all radiation is planned individualized for people. We do a CAT scan before the treatment, 
a doctor will draw in where your prostate is, but they'll also draw in where your rectum and bladder and other normal structures are. Figuring out an, an, an array of angles to aim the radiation, maximizing the dose to the prostate and minimizing the dose to normal structures. We know the prostate can move day to day. One thing that we ask urologists like Dr. Shulman, Dr. Balani to do is before the radiation is done to put three non-radioactive gold seeds in the prostate. So this is very different than the brachytherapy. Uh, the seeds are put in very similar to the biopsy. And you might be able to see these little specks here. So each day before the, uh, the radiation treatment, and I'll go into number of treatments in a moment, we basically take films, find where the seeds are, which is basically saying where is the prostate that day, and we'll adjust the beam of the radiation so we're aiming at the correct spot. We know the prostate can move based on how much rec uh, air or, or stool is in the rectum or how much urine is in the bladder. So it's just a way of targeting day to day. In terms of the specifics of radiation, it's a daily treatment, Monday through Friday, for about seven and a half weeks. And the treatments are very quick. They take about 10 to 20 minutes. Our center is open approximately 7.30 to 5 every day. That patient's walking in, walking out, you know, every 15 minutes getting treatment. In terms of the side effects of external radiation, they're very similar to the brachytherapy side effects. But the difference is with brachytherapy, the side effects tend to be the most the day of the implant and go down with time. With external radiation, they tend to build up and crescendo over the seven and a half weeks. So the same burning frequency and urgency with urination tends to be a little bit more in the way of uh, bowel symptoms like urgency and frequency. There's a little bit of tiredness with radiation, but nothing debilitating. And hair loss is just in the area of treatment, if that, so no hair loss on the head. Long-term side effects months or years after the uh, external radiation is done, what are things that we see? So the radiation can scar the bladder a little bit, so people may not be able to hold as much urine. You may have to urinate more often. You might get some strictures or, and or blood in the urine. Just like the brachytherapy, you may need to be on urinary medication long-term. The back of the prostate and the front of the rectum are right next to each other. And about the 10 to 20% of men, they can have damage to the rectum, which can result in minimal volume, intermittent, permanent uh, rectal bleeding. So, for example, a man might notice a drop or two of bright red blood on the toilet paper or on the stool, maybe once or twice a week, and that could last for, for years, maybe even uh, for their lifetime. The chance that the bleeding would be so severe that you need a blood transfusion or an operation is very low, 1% or less. Erectile function, we basically say there's about a 50-50 risk of having erectile dysfunction with external radiation. Again, the better your, your erectile function is before, the better your chances are after. Uh, the difference compared to surgery is that it tends to be a slower decline over a few you know, months or years rather than immediate change. And uh, more men tend to um, kind of respond to medications, oral medications, compared to uh, surgery-induced erectile dysfunction. Like brachytherapy, there is a risk of causing a cancer. It's a low risk, one in a thousand. It typically, typically takes 10 to 20 years. We're dealing with the population, older men, uh, where th those risks are very low, and a lot of men at the age that we treat uh, may not have a 10 to 20-year life expectancy, or at least 20 years, I should say. Uh, someone had asked about proton radiation earlier. All the radiation I was talking about uh, just previous was photon, P-H-O-T-O-N. This is P-R-O-T-O-N. For many years, there were two proton centers in the country, uh, Loma Linda in Southern California and then also Mass, uh, Mass General in Boston. There's about half dozen to a dozen new centers that have opened over the last five years. Basically, protons, if you remember from your high school uh, physics, it's that particle in the middle of an atom. And that can be used to deliver the radiation just like a photon is used. Biologically, it does the same thing. The only difference is there tends to be less radiation dose around the organ that you're treating with protons rather than photons. But most importantly, there's no difference that's been shown in any study that protons are superior to photons in terms of controlling the disease or side effects. Uh, the closest facility, as I mentioned, that offers proton treatment is in Loma Linda. And because there's no evidence of any benefit with proton treatment, patients that opt for this uh, would do this out of pocket. Again, 99% or more of the centers in this country don't use protons. UCSF, Stanford, UC Davis, all of the other community hospitals in this area. There are some applications for protons, especially in treating uh, children with cancer that get radiation. 
uh, some of those characteristics of having less dose around what you're trying to treat can be very useful for, uh, for kids. Uh, but I think in terms of prostate, if there's any difference, it would be very small. And I think I, I'm not sure kind of what the future is for protons in this country because it's also a very expensive treatment. I'm going to finish up talking about anti-hormonal therapy. This is something that's unique uh, only when people choose external radiation when they have intermediate and high-risk disease. It's basically a treatment uh, that's used to lower the testosterone uh, because testosterone is a growth factor for prostate cancer. So in men with intermediate and high-risk disease that choose external radiation, we'll often recommend adding anti-hormonal th therapy. For men with intermediate risk disease, it's four to six months of anti-hormonal therapy starting a couple months before the treatment. For men with high-risk disease, we may recommend even longer-term treatment, sometimes up to two to three years. Why do we use anti-hormonal therapy? There are studies that show that in men getting external radiation with intermediate to high-risk disease, lowering the testosterone, which lowers the activity of the prostate cancer, leads to better prostate cancer outcomes. And we see that the younger the patient is and the sh shorter amount of time we use anti-hormonal therapy, the better the chance the testosterone comes back afterwards. That's a good segue to talk about what are side effects of using anti-hormonal therapy. When we give anti-hormonal therapy just for a few months, the things that we typically see are sexual dysfunction, not being interested in sex, and the hot flash is kind of like a male menopause. It usually resolves after the treatment is done. If we give anti-hormonal therapy for long periods of time, in the years, another way of saying this is what happens if you take away a man's testosterone for a long period of time? See things like osteoporosis or bone weakening. Uh, people can have anemia or low blood counts. People tend to lose muscle, gain fat, have higher risk of getting diabetes. And sometimes people can become depressed when you change their testosterone levels for a long period of time. One question people have is, what, what happens if the cancer comes back after I have radiation treatment? What happens if the PSA rises after radiation is done? Typically, we don't recommend surgery. Uh, there tends to be a lot of risk in terms of, uh, because of scar tissue caused by the radiation. It could cause a rectal injury, cause urinary injury, including incontinence. And we typically can't give more radiation. We try to give as much radiation safely up front, not reserving something in case the cancer comes back. The main things that we look at in terms of uh, treatment if the cancer comes back after radiation is freezing the prostate or cryotherapy, or the same anti-hormonal therapy that I was talking about that can be combined with radiation can also be used as a salvage or backup if the cancer comes back. My name is Dr. Shulman. I'm a urologist at Kaiser Santa Rosa, and I'll be talking to you today about active surveillance. And this, uh, we put this after the active treatment options for a reason, and I'll explain as we, we, we discuss this today. So active surveillance, we add the term with curative intent to that to suggest that this is an active treatment option. And as you learned early on today, uh, the vast majority of men do not die from prostate cancer. Many men with prostate cancer will die of other causes. And then you sat in on the second part of the discussion today, talking about surgery and radiation, and then you got to hear about all the potential risks, such as incontinence, erectile dysfunction, a global feeling of depression or anger or anxiety. All of these things lessen one's quality of life. So out of this situation, a lot of men in your situation are saying to yourselves, well, gosh, I, I have prostate cancer. If I play my odds, if I have a low risk disease, I may never die from it. So you can't guarantee me that I'll live longer if you treat me. But on the other, on the other hand, if I have treatment, you pretty much can guarantee me I'll have some type of side effect whether it's mild or severe, I'll have some degree of erectile dysfunction or some degree of incontinence or urgency or frequency or some problem that lessens the quality of my life. So out of this, out of these, out of this situation of, of many men not having life-threatening cancers and the risk of over-treatment arose the concept of active surveillance. This has been around roughly for about 10 years or so and it's emerging as an excellent treatment option for many men. And the goals of active surveillance as listed on the slide here is essentially to prevent unnecessary treatment, prevent unnecessary loss of quality of life if a man has a non-life-threatening cancer. On the same token, it's to help us identify men 
who may potentially have life-threatening cancers as early as possible. And once we identify that the cancer may be life-threatening, we act and you can undergo one of the treatments that you just heard uh, earlier in today's presentation. So in trying to decide if you're a good candidate for active surveillance, I should say that there's no black and white. There's no definition of who's a good candidate um, that's not set in stone. So what I'm going to show, show you here on this slide are just some general guidelines that we think of when we're counseling men about whether they're good candidates for surveillance. So number one, the, when the cancer is not felt on digital rectal exam or a stage T1C. Number two, when the PSA is less than 10, a Gleason score of 6. Most men have had a 12 or 14 core biopsy, so if there are three or less cores with cancer. And if any one core has or uh, less than 50% involvement of any one core. These are just some general, general guidelines to consider who may be a good candidate for surveillance. So when considering whether you want to undergo active surveillance, we've listed here some important considerations that many men will want to think about. Um, number one, potential loss of quality of life with treatment. There are many men who, who for their own with their own particular values, prefer their quality of life over quantity of life. And so they're thinking about quality of life as a very critical factor. However, in, in selecting active surveillance, men have to be comfortable with that potential that they may lose that opportunity of cure. In general, prostate cancer is slow growing. In general, we think we're able to identify cancers if they're progressing or becoming more aggressive. But you still have to be comfortable that while watching a cancer, there are no guarantees and that you may lose a window of opportunity to cure it should the cancer grow. Another very important a concept here is that um, of anxiety of living with your disease. Your doctors may reassure you that you have a non-life-threatening cancer, a low-risk cancer, the chance of death from the cancer or some significant events very low. But that does not mean that men are going to automatically be comfortable living with a cancer that's untreated. And so we don't want to underestimate the power of anxiety that men may have living with an untreated cancer. And the last item on the slide is that we know from research to date, again, this is an emerging treatment option, but to date, we can say approximately 30% of men who choose surveillance at some time in the future will choose some type of treatment, be it surgery or radiation. And they may choose treatment because of anxiety or because the cancer itself is growing. If you opt to do active surveillance, um, it can be done any number of ways. There's no exact uh, recipe for doing it. In general, uh, you and your, your urologist will come up with a follow-up plan involving regular PSA checks and regular uh, rectal examinations. As good as PSA is, as good as the exams are, the most important thing really is, is repeat prostate biopsies. That's the only tool that we currently have to know if the cancer's gotten bigger or become more aggressive. The timing of that first biopsy um, is variable. Some men will choose to have a biopsy earlier within the first three to six months. We call that a verification or confirmation biopsy. If, that bi well, if a man has that, we know that about 30% of the time that biopsy will show more extensive cancer than what we originally thought. It's not more extensive because it grew. It's not more ex extensive because three to six months is a long time. It's more extensive because the original biopsy um, understaged it, which means it just didn't catch it. It just didn't pick it up. Thereafter, the next biopsy is usually in one year. If everything looks good after that first annual biopsy, then the frequency of subsequent biopsies can be quite variable, anywhere from annually to up to five years. And the biopsy, again, is the most important um, tool we have during active surveillance. During active surveillance, when might a man choose treatment? So as I alluded to earlier, um, if the cancer grows, uh, we sometimes will see the cancer growing just by PSAs. We'll see a rapidly rising PSA, which may prompt another biopsy or just um, going right to treatment. If we feel a new nodule in the prostate, or if the repeat biopsy shows 
a, a higher Gleason score, so if a man went from a Gleason 6 to a 7, or from a 7 to 8, or if there's an increase in volume, such as if you have one or two out of 12 cores with cancer now, the repeat biopsy shows six or seven cores with cancer, that would, that would be an indication that treatment is necessary. And very importantly, patient preference or anxiety. Some men uh, just need to have it done for peace of mind and to allay their fears and anxiety. As I mentioned just a moment ago, active surveillance is a relatively new treatment option, so the information we have is evolving and changing. To date, what I can tell you is that approximately 30% of men who choose active surveillance will choose a treatment um, at some point during surveillance. What we know to date is that there's no difference in survival in men between who undergo immediate treatment versus men who have delayed treatment. So that, that means if, if a man has treatment now, or he delays it for whatever reason, one, two, three, five, six years or so, we know there's no difference in cure rates. We know that 97%, uh, there's a 97% survival rate after 10 years of surveillance. The ratio of other cause to prostate cancer mortality or death is 19 to 1. So that means that men on active surveillance, men are dying of other causes 19 times more frequently than they are dying of prostate cancer. And there's one little caution at the end which is going to require some explanation. And the caution is that 50% of men treated radically with either surgery or radiation experience a PSA failure. I'm going to back up to try to explain that caution. If a man chooses prostate, uh, prostatectomy or radiation therapy, in general, his chance of cancer coming back at some point in the future is about 15%. So if you choose surgery or radiation, 85% of the time it works fine for the remainder of the man's lifetime. If you look at 100 men who undergo active surveillance, approximately 30% of them will choose treatment. So that's 30 out of 100 men. Of those 30 out of 100 men, we know that about half of those, or 15 or 15%, will fail their treatment. So what we're seeing is that men who have treatment immediately or men who delay their treatment have the same outcomes. So it could be that men who need treatment during active surveillance have the most aggressive cancers, although we're not able to identify it up front, and they may ultimately not benefit from any of our treatments. If there are questions about that, we'll I'll take them at the, at the break. So during active surveillance, a man's eager to do active surveillance. He's a good candidate for active surveillance. But he says, he asked the question, it's a very common question, what can I do to help myself? So we've listed some things here that we think may be helpful. Um, one very important recommendation, again, uh, again, there's not a lot of evidence to support this. But there is some good evidence that eating a plant-based diet, also a vegetarian diet, um, based upon vegetables, fruits, soys, and tomatoes, may be beneficial. And there is actually some research supporting this recommendation. We recommend limiting consumption of, of fats, especially animal fats and dairy products. And beyond that, there are no specific dietary recommendations or supplements. A lot of men will ask, should I take lycopene supplement? And the answer is no, eat tomatoes. Lycopene supplements have not been proven to be helpful. So there's no specific supplement that I'd recommend that anybody purchase other than eating a diet very rich in vegetables and fruits. We recommend exercise and limiting stress. I'm going to switch to a next, our next topic, and this is called watchful waiting. I want to make a very strong point that this is different than active surveillance. We put it up here for completeness sake. The fact that you're in this room probably means that you're not even close to being a candidate for watchful waiting. But you may come across this term in your research or in your conversations with people. Watchful waiting is not a curative treatment option. This is reserved for men who, for various reasons, decide they don't want anything done and um, this is something you would decide 
in conjunction with your doctor if that's something you were interested in. Who may want to consider watchful waiting? This would be somebody who's very advanced in age, you know, 90 years old, multiple medical problems, um, has a very, very short life expectancy for various reasons. Clearly their risk of dying from other causes is far greater than the prostate cancer. Um, if the prostate cancer is very advanced at the time of diagnosis and the man opts to maximize quality of life, watchful waiting is a good option. The next section um, will be to go over other prostate cancer treatment options. We put this in for completeness sake because you may hear about some of these things. The first option is called cryotherapy. Cryo stands for freezing and that's where the prostate is frozen. Typically this is not done as first-line treatment. Surgery or radiation would be considered first-line treatment and this is not offered for most men as a first-line treatment for a variety of reasons. It is mainly done within our system uh, for men who have had the cancer come back after radiation therapy and that's the most appropriate use for cryotherapy. A very commonly asked about and uh, interesting um, treatment option is something called high intensity focused ultrasound called HIFU for short. HIFU is a procedure where um, ultrasound waves are used to generate an incredible amount of heat to destroy the prostate. Men like this option because it's the least invasive of the options that are available. It involves putting an ultrasound probe in the rectum kind of similarly to what you had done for your biopsy and ultrasound, high intensity ultrasound waves are passed into the prostate. It works very similarly to taking a magnifying glass, having the sun shine through the magnifying glass to a point, and then you take that hot little point and you can burn a uh, leaf or a wood or uh, unsuspecting bug. And if you put your hand between the magnifying glass and that hot point, you don't feel any heat. This works the same way. The, the heat heats up a very, the ultrasound heats up a very specific part of the prostate and that hot beam is scanned through the prostate to essentially destroy the prostate with heat. What's important about this procedure to know is that it is not FDA approved, so it is only available in the United States by going through a research study, which is currently not available in, the, in Northern California. Men who opt for this usually leave the country to have it done most commonly they go to Mexico. Some of our patients have gone uh, to Canada and Europe and occasionally to Japan to have it done. The reason it's not approved in the United States is because it does have some very significant risks, although infrequent should those risks occur, they can be very devastating. And so I'm, I'm currently not recommending this, but for those men who really, really want it, it's usually a minimum of twenty twenty five thousand dollars out of pocket expense to go to Mexico to have it done. A lot of men will ask about chemotherapy and in general chemotherapy is not at all recommended or useful in the early stages of prostate cancer except in some limited use in research trials. And the last the last section is is coming to the conclusion here of our discussion and the question is what to do next. We recommend that you look at the handouts you got today, review your risk group, look at, look at all the summary. You can also go on to your doctor's My Doctor Online, um, which I'll show you here in a moment, where we have the slides. Actually, I think that's in Santa Rosa. I'm not sure if that's in Marin. So, um, but you can go to your doctor's homepage and find the slides. Once you've thought about it and you decide what you want to do, I rec we recommend that you follow up with your referring urologist. He or she will work with you to decide the next step, make the appropriate referrals, and uh, guide, you, guide your care. You can access this presentation through a number of sites. One is your doctor's homepage, but also by going to the kaisersantarosa.org cancer website, where you can find a link uh, to these slides. That concludes our presentation.